brings light, it's clarity and brings understanding. Let's dive into your word today. Thank you, Lord, that you shall glorify yourself when you come. Bless us. The Bible, the John, the John, Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today is going to be a little different. I'm going to just start sharing my screen. All right. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. All right. Praise God. All right. Let's see what I've got to do. Yeah, you know, just wrap, share a little. And anywhere that anybody wants to make any comments, um, please feel free. I believe I should take this approach in looking at two scriptures today. Um, because what I think we, we, we can do is use some kind of a reference in the scriptures to look at some of the things that have been taught um, consistently in, in our church over the last six months, if not the year. If, if you were to sit down and just think and ask what have been the, the two most dominant themes that have been taught by Pastor David in church, um, I guess we'd all agree that two of the main themes that have been taught are one, um, moving from our needs you see, we know that the scriptures talks about yes, or God shall supply all our needs. But you know, are we taking it to the extent where God really becomes our shield and butler and not our shield and buckler? Um, kindly, kindly say that. Steve, I don't know, something is kind of you sound a little, I don't know if you have a fan on or something, it's kind of coming in and out. Okay, you hear me much better now. Yes. Yeah. All right. Praise God. Yeah. Um, so as I said, the two thanks for that. The two central um, or the two main themes that have been been taught or that are being taught um, by Pastor David over the last six months to the year is um, moving from just our needs. You know, uh, we, do we serve God because? Or what are the things we want from him? I mean, yes, God has promised to, to supply our needs and be that shield round about us. But what about God's purpose, right? And 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 we've been seeing a lot of scriptures and teaching on 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 the purposes of God, having more predominance over our lives than just our individual needs. And the, the second, what I would call the dominant theme that, that has been, that is being feared is the whole issue of us having this desire to share the word of the Lord and to, to minister to the word, the word of the Lord to, to those who we come in contact with. Because we recognize Right. If, if many of us we were saying, okay, God, what's the purpose for my life? And you're wondering, okay, which direction is the Lord taking? Well, while you while you wait for that specific word, one thing which the scripture does say is that we are to, to share the gospel. So therefore, do we have any 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 passion for the Lord? So what I want us to do is to look again at two scriptures, two scriptures that I know that we are very familiar with. But amazingly, there were some verses inside, this, in, inside these two passages that sometimes we might skip over and miss and don't understand the central theme. So the first one I want us to look at is, is a well-known scripture of John 11. Well, you know, John 11 speaks about um, Lazarus. So if I were to ask, what would you think is your understanding of the story of Lazarus? If one person could just give me an answer. I mean, more than likely your answer is going to be correct. But I'm going to ask just one person just to 
to say, what do you think is a central theme of the story of Lazarus? Any one person, and then we dive into it. I don't get someone, I might have one call on someone. Steve, when I think of the story of Lazarus, I'm thinking of the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Yes. And, you know, it is good that he had specified Lazarus come forth. Yes. Because if he didn't specify, I think every dead would come to life because of the <laughs> powerful resurrection power that Jesus has, mm. mm -hmm. you know. And mm. it was also faith because even though Mary was saying, oh my goodness, God, Lord Jesus, if you came before, he would not have died. You know, mm -hmm. at least Jesus was assuring her and he was proving to her at that point, or, you know, she was made very aware that, you know, it's not just that he's going to resurrect one day or, you know, you see him one day in the future. If you get to heaven, you see him. But Jesus was there and he is the resurrection and Amen. the life. And that's Amen. why he came, you know, came, came back to life. Well, you know? get, get your spiritual sticker and come to the head of the class. <laughs> the, bang on, bang on. so let's look on a couple of things and let us look to see if if there's something in the scripture as we read it we can look on the purposes of god god's purpose being more 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 dominant and necessary rather than our needs. So if you're able to see the screen, it says, now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So at this point, Lazarus was sick, and it says, Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So Jesus now we recognize that Jesus had a relationship with, with, with Lazarus and his two sisters. But because the scripture says, man, him love them. But, so they said to him, okay, listen, come now, because boy, the person who you love him is sick. And scripture says in verse 4 that when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. And I want everybody, if you can underline that, it says, but for the glory of God. So Jesus was establishing here and foremost <clears throat> that what was going to be happening in, in, in Lazarus's life was going to be for the glory of God. But the question is now, what event? was going to be for the glory of God. And we'll see that to further down as we read. But, so it says, the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. And interestingly, this, this it, it would almost seem almost like a paradox because you'd want to think that if, if there's someone who is your friend and you know they're no ill, the first thing you'd want to do is to naturally want to run by run to their side and to, to see in what way you can help. But the scripture says that Jesus did the actual opposite. You know, the actual opposite, which was to stay two extra deals. Now, why is that? Is there something in that script in the scripture that we can see further, can open our eyes a bit? Huh? So he about two. So therefore, Jesus setting the <clears throat> he's setting the stage for us to recognize that how the Lord does his things is in his timing because he wants to get the glory. So you see now that Martha would have come to Jesus and now said, listen, we have a need. 
And the need is, what Martha actually says is that, listen, this is not just anybody who is just a passing acquaintance. Good? This is somebody who knows you. And I am somebody who knows you. And I'm saying, listen, the person who you're in your bedroom, good, is a need. And what did Jesus do? Rather than come immediately, he spent two days. <laughs> and in verse 7, it says, Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Okay, after the two days, let us go unto Judea again. And his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again? So here you find now those who are with Jesus now saying, Listen, yeah, God, you have your purpose, but listen, look on the circumstances that are around you. You have people around you that want to kill you. Good? So, so, so these friends, though good they may have been, these disciples, in not understanding what Christ wanted to do, good, were willing to literally make recommendations which were contrary to what Jesus had instructed. And that, I think, is a teaching for us, but that's another day. Hmm? It says here, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that, he said unto them, our friend Lazarus, Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be Jesus speak of his death? But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, look, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So Jesus here made a statement in verse 15 where he said, listen, I'm glad I wasn't there when he was ill. But now that everybody is now saying that, okay, he's dead. Let's go and raise him out of his sleep. Then said, verse 16, then said Thomas, who is called Didymus, unto his fellow, his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Then, when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave four days already. Now, Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Let's look at verse 21. She says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt, ask of God, God will give to thee. And these two verses is interesting. What, is in, what in effect is Martha saying? You know, Lord, I know that anything that you can do, if you ask the Father, Good to do it, he'll do it. But guess what? This miracle that we believe that you can do now, we needed it four days ago. Good. So right now, if you were four days before, right, he would have just been ill and you could have dealt with it. But now I'm dead. But nonetheless, I know that you can do it. And I want us to examine ourselves. Right? How many times are we guilty? of actually saying to the Lord, Lord, I know you can do this. I trust you because your word such and such says such and such and we can quote the scriptures and somewhere between us quoting the scriptures, we still have an attitude where we say, but nevertheless, if you had acted four days ago, it wouldn't have been in the position that it is in now. We do it many times, right? Let's be all honest with ourselves because we have our own timelines many times in how we want things to be accomplished. Good, But rather than fully yielding to the Lord and say, Lord, okay, do things how you would have it done. 
we still sell a lot of trust you, but we say anyway, still may have a little writ. Or maybe not a little writ, but just want to tell you something, God. I needed it four days ago. Or I needed it a week ago. Or I needed it a month ago. And this, I think, is something that needs to challenge us. Let's look a bit further. So after she said, if you had been here, right, my brother had died, it shows you another thing. Martha, in verse 21, tries to make the subject of this story be about Lazarus and Lazarus not dying. So up to this point in verse 21, good? If we were to think of Lazarus and you'll, of, of Martha, and you'll see even with some of the, um, as we look at some of the scriptures further down, good? Everyone had the mindset that the focus of what was to happen was the healing of Lazarus rather than his raising from the dead. That was their purpose. That was their objective. But the question is, was it God's objective? So let's look at this. Verse 22, where she says, but I know that even now, whatever thou will ask of God, God will give it to her, give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection, as, as was said earlier. Good. And the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, speaking, saying, the master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her. You see, and, and, and let's stop a little, comforted her. So, so in other words, for them, even the friends and the, the, the acquaintances, for them, everything was final. So therefore to talk about comforting her, they saw everything as with some measure of finality, which meaning to say, listen, Jesus was not here to heal Lazarus. And therefore, with Lazarus not being dead, the only thing that they can think of was comforting. Going again, the focus of everyone up to this point was not God's purposes, not God's plans. So it says here in verse 31, as we continue, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come, where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, thou hast been here, my brother had not died. So even Mary had the same concept, or was of the same mindset, rather, as Martha, because for them, the centrality was that Lazarus should not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, verse 33, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. He just wept. Then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. So the Jews now come into play. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, right, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, 
thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave stones, grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, loose him and let him go. Now for many of us, coming up over the years, growing up as children, going to Sunday school, having been exposed to the story of Lazarus, would recognize that or we would read this story really from verse 1 to verse 44, thinking that was really the real essence of the death of Lazarus. But I want us to know to look at verse 45. It says, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto him, you guys don't know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in, in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. And I want now everyone to underline verse 53. It says, then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. I'm going to make a bold statement now. The story of Lazarus heralds and puts in place the beginning of God's purpose, which is the death of Christ. I'm going to say it again. We will look at the story of Lazarus from a context of one who was ill and therefore being ill, we see the tension amongst people who knew the Lord, who said, boy, Lord, he's ill and healing. But the scripture says, listen, this is for the glory of God that God's name will be glorified. And yes, God's name was glorified when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But the scriptures here says in verse 53, it says, then from that day. In other words, church, it was from the event of the raising of Lazarus that Herod did know the plot for Jesus' death which was God's ultimate purpose. The death of Christ was God's ultimate purpose. And the story of Lazarus, though it may have been concentrated around a sister, two sisters and a brother who died and who knowed Christ and Jesus raising him from the dead, I put it to you that a key element of this story is that yes that's good 
That's fine because Jesus says I'm the resurrection. But I want to state to you that a key element of that story is that the death of Lazarus heralded the beginning of God's final purpose being played out, which was the death of Christ. And why I said that? Because verse 53 says so. It says, then from that day forth, they took counsel for to put him to death. That was the purpose of God. That Jesus, you know, the lamb that was slain, put to death to bring salvation. So why would I share this now as, as we look through many of the, the scriptures and teaching that we would have gotten from Pastor David as he would talk about the purposes of God. And yes, as we go through our challenges and, and the issues of life that we're going through, and boy, sometimes we have to be, sometimes it's a struggle, etc. But he's saying, listen, look beyond our own needs. Look beyond our own wants. If we stick to just looking at just our needs, we will only see the story of Lazarus. But if we look beyond our own needs to God's purposes, we'll recognize that the story of Lazarus is about the redemptive plan of God to redeem the world. And I was blessed when I read this again. And I said, my gosh, look how I would have easily missed it. Missed it. Because the plan of God was the death of Jesus Christ to bring glory to himself. So that we could be redeemed. So that's one of the scriptures I just wanted us to just go through and look again. because. We have been getting the teaching, church. Good. We have been getting the teaching Sunday after Sunday on understanding that it's more than just our needs and our wants. Yes, God is interested in all of that. But I want to say to you that the teaching that we've been getting here in church on Sunday is about what is God's bigger plan, his bigger purpose, and therefore how you fit into his purpose. And are we, therefore, just willing enough to just see ourselves just like the Lazarus incident? Or are we, are we able to see that whatever we go through is actually part of a bigger plan that God has to bring glory to his name? Next, I want us to look at. Another well-known scripture. Again, as I'm saying, we're just sharing on some of the things that, you know, that we have been, been learning over the last couple of months that's been taught. I want you all, can everybody still see the screen? Hello? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can see. All right. Great. I want us to look at Mark 6. Again, something that I realized just this week. Mark 6 is another famous, well known scripture in that it speaks about two miracles that Jesus performed one, the feeding of the 5,000 men, and the other, when he walked on water and rescued his disciples. And you know, one thing I'm realizing, church, sometimes we're caught up in some of the, 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 the more explosive stuff, the, the, the miracles, say, and we recognize that there's, there are some hidden truths that the Lord is teaching us. And sometimes those hidden truths are just in a sentence that is quietly somewhere and we miss it. I want us to look at Mark 6 again. 
It marks it's verse 42. So what do we see here at verse 42? It says, and they did all eat and were filled. So um, we can, we're going to go up to some verses prior to 42, but at this point in verse 42, um, the, the fed the thousands, and Jesus said, make sure you gather up everything. And they um, took up, I believe, 12 baskets, right? So verse 43 says, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Verse 44, and they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. So again, let me just interject right here. We're just going through two stories to see how some things we can learn from these two stories and, and juxtapose it or position it against some of the things we have been teaching by just using the Bible as examples. So in verse 46, it says, then when he had sent them away, he had he departed unto a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone, that's he alone, Jesus on the land. And the scripture says in verse 48, and he saw them toiling in rowing. Now, if you position this verse 48, this first section, verse 48a, it, it, it sounds similar to what we had just read in that when the persons came to Jesus, or Martha, no, the persons came to Jesus and said, listen, come quickly, come quickly, because um, um, that's what he's here. Well, yeah, the scripture says he abode two more days. Good. In the same context here, well, it says that when this um, right, it says here, he went to the mountain to pray, and when verse 47, and when the evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. Verse 48, and he's I'm not hearing you, Professor Steve. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, so sorry. I um I accidentally muted the mic. Right. So did you hear the part where I said um verse 47? And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, and he saw them toiling in rowing. And it's amazing that in verse 48, it is similar um, in context uh, when, when, when you look at the, the story of, of Lazarus, when they came to Jesus and said, listen, Lazarus is sick, your friend. In other words, they told, they gave Jesus every reason why he should come now. Well, because he was your brethren, your good friend, come and the scripture says, man, he abode two more days. Because it wasn't about the friend, it was about the glory of God. And here again, in this scripture, Jesus saw the disciples toiling. Good. But Jesus stayed in, on the land, in the mountain to pray. So it says here about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed them, passed by them. But when they saw him, walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked to them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. No, I, I am heartened and encouraged when I see a scripture like this, because you could see now that the, the disciples were in fear. Right, they cried out to the Lord as a matter of fact, they were wanting to do some kind of a spirit. But the first thing that Jesus said to them was, Be of good cheer. Good. It is I, be not afraid. So, therefore, as you go through the, your, your troubles of, of life and, and what may seem like 
you know, storms of, of, of many issues that would want to weigh you in. But yes, we get the comforting word, um, be not afraid. But I want to say to you, church, that there are some key nuggets now in the scripture that we might have missed. In verse 51, it says, And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. And look at verse 52. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. No, where does verse come from? This is a story about the disciples being caught in a boat. We hear many messages where people talk about in the storms of life. I mean, we've heard so many messages on it, so many, and good though they are, but I want to say to you that there are other elements to this message. So we have heard messages, you can, you can hear messages about the timing of God in that the people were in the boat, but Jesus on the land, but Jesus continued praying because Jesus knew that they would not die. Good. We, we, you, you have heard messages where they now see Jesus walking and they would have cried out. And the first thing that Jesus did was to come and comfort them. So there have been tons of messages on that. Right? And Jesus would have said, be not afraid. And he comforted them. And then when he went into the, into the ship, it says the wind ceased and they were so amazed. So we would have heard a lot of messages by people that talk about the Lord who is the Lord of the winds and the rains and the storms. So therefore the Lord can quieten all the storms in your life. And that is good. But verse 52 is also key. Where did verse 52, it's almost as if, you know, when you... You know, like when, you know, we, we, we're talking to our friends and we, we're talking about a particular subject. And then all of a sudden, somebody in the group just says something and you say, where did that come from? I mean, what did that have to do with what we're talking about? I'm sure it has happened to many of us. So we say, where are we going to get head or something? All that coming to what we talk about is the same thing here. Right? It says here, and the Greek... But the word considers also includes the, 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 the phrase remember. So they did not consider, they, they remembered not well, the miracle of the loaves, but it goes a bit further. It says, for their heart was hardened. What does a hardened heart have to do with people in a boat? And I would want to suggest to you that the scriptures answers it. The scriptures answers it by making reference to the miracle of the loaves. So if you want to get an understanding of the hardened heart of the disciples, then you have to look back again at the story of the loaves. And maybe that can help you understand a better context of them in the wind because something happened in their heart which caused it to be hardened, which affected the level of the miracle that God would have performed in their lives, which would have caused them to cry out in fear. So, ready? how much time do we have? How much time do we have? Praise God. And 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 what's the three would agree with Heather that sometimes that part they were laughing. But 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 yeah 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 months in front of you, so you you don't need to. Okay, pressure yourself. Okay, okay. Because somewhat feel I've gone over. Have I gone over time? Well, it's now six. Well, five five forty your time. Six forty my time. Okay, okay. It, it can pause in about five minutes and then we can pick up next week if you want. Okay. All right, praise God. So I want to say to you that looking at this scripture, this scripture opens your eyes because it says to understand this miracle that Jesus had to work in their lives, to understand 
why the disciples were in fear and had to cry out to understand why Jesus had to say, be of good cheer. There was something that was wrong. And the scriptures explained it. The scripture says they did not understand the miracle of the loaves. There are at least two other scriptures in Luke, one in Luke that I can remember, where Jesus had to say to his disciples when they were talking to him, he said, listen, you still don't understand the story about the loaves and the fishes. Because the miracle of the loaves and the fishes is not about food. That's where their head says was. Just like the story of Lazarus, where everyone would have thought that the story of the miracle is about Jesus raising someone from the dead, what was actually the setting of the environment what? for the coming death of Jesus Christ. What Jesus was saying is that because they never understood the story of the loaves, their hearts were hardened. And because they had a hardened heart, then when they were going through the storms of life, good, they more cried out in fear than trusted the Lord. So what we have to do is to look back again on the story of the Lord. Um, Pastor D, this is going to take some time. So I think what I'll do, I'll, I'll just hold here because I think we have enough already just to think on, just to read back again John 11 and to read again the verses that would have seen with the miracle on the water to set the stage um, for this. Because what we'll see when we go through it is that the disciples' hearts were hardened because when Jesus anointed them, they were anointed with power to, to, to cast out devils and to heal. And what you'll read as you read through the first portion of, of, of Mark 6 is that the disciples came back with, with so much news to tell Jesus, man, even the, the, the demons are subject unto us. We have power and authority. Man, this is great. And there were crowds of people. And the scripture says that Jesus was moved with compassion and wanted to minister to them. And the scripture says in the, in the, as in the weariness of the evening, that the disciples, these disciples who were moving in power and authority, actually said to Jesus, the day is now spent and we have no food. So these hungry belly people who you see here come to hear from you. The disciples said to Jesus, send them away so that they can find food. It shows the hardening of the heart. There's so much power and the authority because they were consumed with that. They were excited with that. They wanted to tell Jesus the amount of, of things that they did. What the scripture says, Jesus was moved with compassion. And he had to look to his disciples and say to them, no, you feed them. You feed them. That's what Jesus said to them. The responsibility to care is your responsibility. The responsibility to have a heart of compassion is your responsibility, right? We can't be saying, Lord, I don't want to go sleep. Lord, you be compassionate to the lost and the unsaved, and you go deal with them. So just bless me, um, bless my wife, um, bless my son and his wife, we four and no more. But Jesus said no. Good. And then he said to them, what do you have in your hand? And the scripture says that there's about all we have is just these couple of loaves and fishes. But you see, that is what Jesus needed to hear for them to stay. This is what we have. This is all that we have. But whatever you have is what Jesus is willing to use to bless. Good. 
And I tell you something, church. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think I'll just spend the two minutes and talk then because I want you to read it. Uh, when I read this scripture, I had to think, think again of, of being in the downtown pier. Uh, if, if you could just sit down in, in the boat that Jesus would have sat in with his disciples and just see the crowds downtown, would, just wanting to get a touch from the master. And then Jesus saying to his disciples, all right, listen, let's move from downtown and go over to Port Moon. Just picture yourself sitting in that boat where the scripture says, hello? Yes, we can. Yeah, man, when the scripture says that the, that the people, they perceived where Jesus was going, so they ran ahead of him. They ran ahead of Christ because they knew where he was going because they wanted to be touched by him. And the scripture says that Jesus was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Can you imagine you sit down in that boat? Everybody, just sit down in that boat a minute. And as you're moving from downtown, going to Portmore across the harbor, and you're seeing the scores and thousands of people just running, running along Marcus Garvey Drive, running over Causeway Bridge, good, running to try to find a way to get around the toll, good, where them said so them walking, them a drive so them can pounce, and them head over to Portmore, good. And Jesus, the scripture says that Jesus saw them with compassion and started to minister to them. And the only thing that could come from the mouths of the disciples was Jesus send them away. Send where the hungry people them. Make them go find something to eat. The very disciples who were so excited of their amount of power that they were able to exercise. And Jesus had to speak to them, no, no, it's not about the power. It's about you taking the responsibility to be compassionate, to be compassionate. That was the story of the loaves and the fishes, compassion where compassion is your responsibility. And I say to you, church, therefore, when we look further in the book of Mark, I put it no more than a question. If therefore our hearts are hardened based on the scripture, is the scripture therefore saying, yes, the scripture is saying that the extent of our heart and the hardness of our heart can actually impact the level of the blessings and miracles that are demonstrated in your own life. Think on it. Think on it. Good. You had disciples who cried out for fear and needed the intervention of Jesus and Jesus told them why they still not understand about having compassion there's something about compassion church compassion as you care for God's people you understand therefore the caring love of Christ himself and therefore you will understand how much Jesus cares for you and therefore, as you go through the storms of life, because you were able to understand fully about compassion for others, which would teach you about the compassion of God for you, when you go through the storms of life, you will know how to trust God because you have a compassionate God who will look out for you. I want us to Think on this church. Just meditate and think on it. And read the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. And then over to you, Pastor. Amen, amen, amen. You know, I, I like what you're implying and you're pushing at. 
that we need to have the heart of compassion. I've heard people sometimes blame God. I said, God, why didn't you do this? God, why didn't you do that? It should be told God we're expect, expecting his people to, to do it. Because they backed off Satan won. It seemed that Satan won. And we need to realize that we are, we are responsibility. We're, we're able to feed the people the bread. Or to stand in faith for God to work. To, for God to get glory. Amen. Amen. Any, any other comments or? Questions. I have a comment to make. You know, Steve, when you were going through that um, part there about the compassion of the disciples, what amazed me is that they were with Jesus all through the time of his ministry. Well, I mean, different disciples were called at different times, you know. But when I reflect on the life of Jesus and his ministry, at no time did he um, refused to help anybody who came, you know, to him either for healing for themselves or for their a member of their family or for him to feed them. You know, it, it just marvels me that although the disciples were around him for so long, they didn't catch that com compassion that he had from an early, early stage. You know, it took them quite a while to get there, you know, and I mean, mm. in my life, I, I, I can reflect right through whether it was a sinner, a Jew, a Gentile, whoever it was, he never ever rejected any of them who came to him with a need, you know? But Amen. this time, they were so quick to say, but you know, you know, Lord, you're really going to do this, or many hungry people them go look them own food. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's so mm. strange that it took so long for them to have that heart of compassion that Jesus had, you know? But I guess we are like that too, you know? We don't immediately sympathize with people. All the time, it takes a little time for us to really acquire that kind of empathy for people that Jesus had, you know? Those mm -hmm. are my thoughts. Amen. Any other comment or question? Yes, I have a question, and that question is lots of comment. Um, the question is, uh, when Jesus came and he said to his disciples, with faith, you can move a mountain and do anything if you have faith as a small grain of a mustard seed. Jesus exercised that which he said to his disciples by how faith works. Now faith is the substance of things who for the evidence of things not seen. Now, but when he came to Lazarus, when he purposefully put Lazarus' sister to the test and said, if paraphrasing it, do you believe that I am the resurrection? You know, and she said, yes later on down in the day of judgment. But he still did not deny her the, the, heal, the, the resurrection power because her faith was weak. He still speak the word and she see it. And after she saw the act, then she believed that it is not only when the resurrection time come that he will be risen, and he also teach his disciple that greater works than these shall he also do if he believe. So the question I'm basically asking to is that over the years I've heard pastors talk, talk about, um, you know, when they prophesied or they preached to somebody and they don't see an instantaneous healing or an instantaneous um, manifestation. They said, because your faith is weak, but continue believing in God and you will see it happen. Now, what Jesus did is basically showing, showing up that what these pastors or are, are people are doing is not, is not what God is basically saying. Okay. So, so. Is that basically the comment or, or is there something you wanted us to just clarify? 
well, you can clarify it if you have been at the time. You know, but so then we can deal with it next week. Okay. Um at, 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 is, 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 your, is your question therefore maybe asking where where is faith in all this? I, I'm trying to no, all right. In other words, over the years I have heard pastors and ministers say that if they, they need somebody to stand in faith for somebody and they stand in proxy and all of that, and all of that set its pace, it, it has a place for God because it's the same God who says, suffer the little children to come unto me is the same God that allows Elisha to curse for the children, curse, curse, you know, the children and two bear come from out of nowhere and kill them. He's the same God that does say, suffer them, don't do them no harm. But yet still he also allowed harm to come to 40 children that was teasing Elijah. So there is there is no an understanding to say, say that he's God, he can do anything. But when it comes to know we as human, we are of the opinion of what have we have been taught, I have been taught through word of life and coming up. They said that if you don't have you know the faith. Healing not going to come if we don't have the faith. Money not going to come if we don't have the faith. This is not going to happen and so on and so forth. But here it is that Jesus buck up on somebody, Jamaican term, meets somebody that says she not have the faith. She not believe. She only believes it will happen when the resurrection come, when judgment day come. But he, he exercised and he showed her that, all right, what, what's this now, Jamaican term? What's what if we move, you know, the he could have removed the stone by using angel himself, but him put them to work and him said, Well, I right, move on, roll away the stone. And whether it be a hundred man or whatever the case is, they move away the stone. And he just prayed and said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he came forth, right, um, when him come out, him said, Well, loose him and do whatever, whether feed them or do whatever the case is, right? And at this time, it makes sure that the man rotten to the core, his muscles rotten and he smell, smell like a dead person. So it goes to show, show that there is a contradiction there in itself saying, saying that when people say that you have to have faith in order for God to heal you, God himself, Jesus, Jesus shows, shows that if you pray, Whenever you, you pray to him, right? And if you believe it work quicker, and if you don't believe what you ask of me, in doubt, you're not gonna receive. But what happened then if someone who's an unsaved, an unbeliever, who just come and say, Boy, Lord, my mother's sick and she's dying, heal on a lot. You don't have no faith, you don't have nothing. You just ask a question for somebody to do something for you, because you love your mother. And him say, all right, cool. And him just heal your mother and your mother come alive. Now, the difference, difference in now between the one who has supposed to have faith because they are a child of God and the one who's not a commit um, under the covenant. But the difference between those two is what? And why is it then that Jesus show us that it's not necessarily meaning that um, if you don't have no faith, then, the, then Lazarus never raised. And if you don't believe, Lazarus never raised. I'm sure you said that even if you don't believe, never sure you say, my word is yes and amen. So he showed to me, well, based on the scriptures, I say, say that whether you believe it or not, he is still God. And he will do what he said that he will do. So, so the thing, thing, thing is now, over the years, what can I use to say? Was I being misled or was I... Um, was these men of God who are preaching from those days coming up to now, are they on the right path or they are, they are not totally in understanding how God works? Unless I'm misunderstanding, it sounds more to me, Ron, like I think you've been answering your questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it more so to me that that the question that you pose, you really use the scripture and you answer it. 
<laughs> Unless I'm still missing something. No, man. I no, think man. I think no, it's more no. um I think it's more a comment than and I guess where he's going than a question because he has really posed the question and answered the question. And no. I guess I guess with God, you know, God is God. There's some that you have to have faith. Um because he says, oh, you have little faith, you know, mm -hmm. and there are times when he will do what he wants to do. Some people, you know, um, cause the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So, um, I mean, yeah, um, you know, there are some situations where God, you, you never, you first don't have any faith and God just um, deliver. And another yeah. person who might, um, you know, you know, don't work. Yeah. So I think it's more like a comment than a question because oh, yeah. it's food for thought. You know, you really have to look at it and say, yeah. And it's true. You know, you you we were taught a certain thing that you know, or the person never had faith when it could be the person who was ministering and not the person who was being ministered to. Right. Yeah. Can I say something to that? Sure. And and I may be going a bit off topic, but um. One of the things that I notice when looking at the parables is that when people came to Jesus or an arts for healing or for a miracle or everything, the key thing that you notice is that they believed in him, that he had the ability to do this. Um, like a lot of the times, or that he was who he said he was, basically. There's a lot of times where like a blind person or a person with leprosy, they would say, call out to him and say, son of David. So in other words, they're saying, you're the Messiah. Um, and then with, with Mary as well, um, she was saying, she said, I know that anything God, uh, anything you ask of God, he'll give you. So uh, even with the, the Syrian Phoenician woman, I forgot Syrian Phoenician woman, whatever, um, the Gentile woman, and she was like, it wasn't so much that they, or Jarius, it wasn't so much that they, they believed that Jesus was, was able to do it. And that's the thing. They, they believed that they believed in Jesus. They believed that he was not an ordinary person. Um, and maybe, maybe that somehow relates Maybe that somehow relates to the disciples as well as that they maybe they didn't really believe that Jesus was, I don't know, Messiah, son of God, divine, you know, that kind of maybe they thought he was, you know, a prophet, a, a great prophet, or maybe they thought he may, they thought he may have been a Messiah, but they didn't understand that he would be someone, I don't know, supernatural, or maybe thinking that he may be more of a, a military leader or something that was going to deliver Israel. But um, a lot of the people that, that asked for miracles, yeah, they believed that they, they called out to him as Messiah, son of David, or, or they believed that he himself, they believed in him himself, that he could do um, what he said he could do, what he was proclaiming, that he wasn't an ordinary person. So maybe that makes a difference is that they don't have to believe that he, have faith for specific things but they believed in him himself maybe i don't know mm. well i think to, to confirm what you had just shared um i think that's taken from from book of acts, acts chapter one where even after his resurrection the disciples were still looking for this messiah to restore the kingdom of jerusalem um you know, and Jesus still had to correct them on again and said, listen, you guys still don't understand. Your, your role now is not to look for this for this king. I, I will come back as this king because the angels made sure to tell them after the scripture says that when they saw him disappear in the sky towards heaven. But Jesus now said, your role now is to go out to, to, to the gospels and teach. And another thing I'll, I'll share with you, I'm still doing some search in the scriptures on, on it. But one of the things that I've recognized, um, when you look in the scriptures with Christ, everything Jesus did basically was instantaneous. 
So his disciples were with him. They saw everything instantaneous. With Christ's ascension, we're now seeing this new phase even in the life of the very disciples where they had to wait, wait on the Lord, be in prayer. Well, we're now in standing for God. And them get beat up, them get beat, beaten, many stripes laid on them. Could they not have said in the name of Jesus Christ, the hedge of protection of the Lord among the moment? But yes, they had all the protection, God's protection around you. But there are certain things that God wills. You know, in the scriptures, in the book of John, Jesus said, I have finished, somewhere between John 14 and John 16, he says, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. So the question is, couldn't there have been more people that Jesus could have raised from the dead? Couldn't there have been more that he could have healed and delivered? Yes. But I think what's instructive when Jesus said, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. We put things for us to make sure that we, we endeavor to be in the place where we say, Lord, in your will, and then follow me, right? And give me the grace to do the work that you would have me to do. I have to take the entire scriptures in, in some measure of balance. I think, I think that's the one thing I would say in answer to, to um, that, you know, it, 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 there's a balance that you have to apply to the scriptures because remember someone like, 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 like Paul, who raised someone from the dead. Remember, he was the one in Corinthians who said, man of fun in the flesh. And three times I've asked the Lord, it make it even sound that boy three for many of us who have gone out 30 times. But you know, one of the things I get from the scripture when Paul said three times I inquired of the Lord is almost as if Paul in, walked in so much faith with God that to ask three times to know God's will was like almost unheard of. Right? But I don't want to jump and put any assumptions. I'll just tell you just what the scripture says. That he said three times and three times we get an answer where God says, no, 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 no. Right? There's a bigger thing for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Still on and bear it. Good. So it, it everything has a context of Quran, as I know you know. Right? And the important thing is is, is God's will. Amen. Uncle Steve, I'd like to um make a comment. Go ahead, my brother. What do you mean? <laughs> All right. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, everyone. Um, what Uncle Uncle Ron shared, I just want to piggyback on that and just to kind of um, okay. There's a scripture in Hebrews. I'm not remembering right now, but I'm driving. Um, where the Bible says, once the first tabernacle is still standing, the Holy Spirit has not yet revealed the way to the most holy place. I believe. In this teaching, um, purpose versus need, that the Holy Spirit is revealing deeper things, the, the, the heart of God be, behind some stuff. Amen? Because I believe that once we understand the heart of God or the purpose of God, so to speak, for everything happening, then the, the end results, we, we will understand the end results more. And before we were focused on the head and how to get to the hen, but then when we go on, go, go to the heart of God concerned the purpose of all this, you know, we hear them say all things work together for good. And then at times we don't really, really believe it, you, you know, <laughs> but, but this is now by the Holy Spirit is now revealing the purpose of all things working together for good. So um, that, that's um, my comment. Amen. Amen. Thanks, 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 Mr. Small. Really appreciate it. All right. It's now 10 past 6. So what I'll probably ask now is um, our sister Raquel Russell, uh, our hostess with the mostess. Um, if she can just end us off, close us off in the closing word of prayer today, I will just bless each other. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Great word, great exhortation.
Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for this time, O oh Father. We thank you, Lord God, that technology could bring us, mighty God, from different points of the earth, O oh God Almighty, to come together in this fashion, Lord, to fellowship and to hear your heart. Hallelujah. We just want to thank you, Lord God Almighty, for the speaker this evening, O oh God, that, Lord, you would have opened up revelation, mighty God, unto him, and that, Lord, he would download from heaven that which was passed on, mighty God, unto him. Lord, we thank you and bless him this evening. We bless Pastor David Ferguson, mighty God, and all those here this evening, mighty God. We thank you for their lives. We thank you, Lord God, for the many blessings, oh God, that you have bestowed upon every person here on this platform and upon their families, oh God. And Lord God, as we separate one from another, we go in the power, the authority, and in the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare a good week. We declare a good evening. We declare, oh God Almighty, that our ears will be open, oh God. Hallelujah. That as you speak, even if you whisper, that God Almighty, we will hear you, Lord. Our lives will be transformed, God. And most importantly, that Lord, our light will shine before men, that they will see your good works and glorify you. Hallelujah. In heaven, we tell you thanks this evening. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. 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 So I'm just going to ask everyone just to open your mics and just say bless you, bless you, everyone. And just everyone have a... God bless day. you. Have a wonderful bless week. Bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank bless you, you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Have Steve. an awesome yeah. week. Have a blessed awesome week, everybody. Week. All right. God, God bless you all. Rowan. Amen. <laughs> Rowan. Blessings, Uncle Rowan. Steve. All is the first that provoked yeah. God. Oh, God, have a good evening. Oh, God be praised, my God. Yeah. Um, Uncle Lance, bless you. Yes, I. <laughs> All right, Mr. Smalling, bless you, my brother. Rowan, I think, I think um, Raquel won't link you, so call her. Oh, okay. All right, bless you all. Amen. Wonderful message, Uncle Steve. Excellent, excellent. Looking forward to more while I review this one. Pastor, bless you.